Y'all are, okay, good, okay. So hi everybody, my name is um, Dr. Kenetta Sugar McFarland. Um, I actually prefer to be called um, Sugar except for my clients, I prefer for them to call me Kenetta. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about um, what is um, neurodiversity and um, in terms of uh, why um, me and why this topic is I'm a part of this community. I'm very open about having um, ADHD, not just because when you're around me, I'm loud and hyper, um, but because I'm also like one of the people that is really for like breaking down the stigma about like saying that you have um, mental health disorders. I would be a person uh, with PTSD if you had talked to me like during my childhood. So I really feel like it's important to be um, open about um, the different um, ways that we're all different and diverse. So what is neurodiversity? Now the term itself was developed in the 90s by an Australian social worker um, named Judy Singer. And she defined neurodiversity as um, the virtually infinite neurocognitive variability within the Earth's human population. It points to the fact that every human has a unique ner nervous system with a unique combination of abilities and needs. And According to the author, this was a political term, and this was based off of the autistic self-advocacy movement. So this was the movement that was having, that was um, being held by autistic um, individuals. And um, uh, Ms. Singer really like noted that there was the women's rights movement. There was the queer rights movement. And so, she really saw this as like the next movement that needed to come around because individuals in these movements all had in times felt misunderstood, felt devalued, and were being treated as second-class citizens in terms of in the society. Now, one of the things that um, Singer is very clear about is that this is a political term, that neurodiverse is not um, like a behavioral health term. And it's a political term to argue for the importance of including all people of all neurotypes need to be included for us to have a thriving human society. And so she really um, thought of, about including neurodiversity in terms of another category of intersectionality. So how we think of like race or how we think of um, gender or sex or somebody's um, socioeconomic level, really thinking about neurodiversity as another area and another lens for us to look at social issues that people were facing and look for like areas of inequality and discrimination. Now, one of the things that neuro, the neurodiverse word has become, it's become an umbrella term for a civil rights movement for neurological minorities. And so we'll talk a little bit about the difference between all of us being neurodiverse, being me as a person who identifies as neurodivergent. So now I wanna talk about the medical versus the social model of disability. And in terms of the way that I was trained, I was trained under the medical model of disability. So the medical model views disability as a defect within an individual. A disability is something that you can't do compared to the normal traits and characteristics of the general population. And so in order for a person to have a quite high quality of life, these defects must be cured or fixed or completely eliminated. 
and healthcare workers and social service professionals are a number of the individuals who have the power to help correct or modify these conditions. But a lot of people have a problem with this view of disability. Many people strongly identify with their disability. It can represent an important part of how we see ourselves, how we connect to our family, how we connect to friends, and how we connect to the, so, the larger society. And you're likely to have a lower self-worth if you internalize that a central piece of who you are is wrong and needs to be fixed. So when disability is seen in a negative light, it leads to increasing thoughts of pity and shame and also helps people to feel disconnected from their community. And it can affect also how we as mental health care professionals can see others. We can look at some of those inspirational stories of people with disabilities accomplishing everyday tasks and really um, misconstrue or misunderstand people's abilities. And we can often not think about people in terms of opportunities or have very low expectations about what it is that they can do. Now, the social model takes a different approach. This model states that disability is the inability to participate fully in your home community environment. And it looks at the relationship between somebody's functional limitations and the impairments and physical and social barriers that exist in the society that stop someone from fully participating. And that full participation is actually what creates the disabling environment. So the social model says that there's a difference between disabilities and an impairment. A disability is a restriction that is imposed by the society. Impairments are the effects of any given condition. So under the social model of disability, it's not about fixing the person. The solution actually looks at changing the way the society functions, changing the way that we do things. So medical care shouldn't just focus on cures and treatments to get rid of a body's um, difficulties. This care should also focus on enhancing how well a person functions daily in the society. So this model looks at um, wanting to end discrimination and oppression for people with disabilities through what is our education and how do we understand about um, disabilities? What are the accommodations that we create in our environment to make sure that everybody can participate in activities? And then also, what are we doing in terms of universal design? Are we looking at how we design things to really consider taking into consideration the individuals that exist in our society? And so when we actually value a bigger spectrum of abilities, we actually increase our knowledge about our environment. Because when we remove disability from the human experience, we really allow individuals in our society to be able to be greater actors in our communities. So one of the things that I do when I'm working um, with individuals is talk to them about supportive environments. And so when we're talking about supportive environments, we're talking about the ways that people get support. And so we're looking at usually two big areas, psychosocial and physical supports. So when I'm working with my clients, these are the areas that I'm going through to make sure that they're actually getting support in terms of on the everyday basis. Are you a person that is facing discrimination? What is your access to health and medical care? Um, 
for the type of care that you need, are you actually getting appropriate care? Because that's really what looking at that access to appropriate health and medical care. Um, what is your access to technology and how does your access or lack of access affect your life? Um, do you celebrate your culture? Is your culture respected around you? What is your employment? Are you fully employed? Are you able to get your needs met? Do you have the support of family? Or, and, and when I say family, I'm often not saying just biological. So in terms of who does the individual identify as family? Do you feel like you're a person that has a role in the economy? Do you have um, community organizations in terms of, are you aligned with them? Are you working with community organizations? Are you connected with others in your environment? Do you have access to social services? In terms of your personality and trait factors, how does that affect you in terms of trying to receive support from your environment? In terms of looking also at your attitudes and emotional states, individuals who are naturally highly emotive who have high levels of emotional states have more difficulties in terms of finding supportive environment. What is your access to fitness and health promoting activities? What is your access to education? In terms of spirituality, people often look at spirituality and think of religion, but when we're talking about spirituality, we're really looking at do you feel like your life has a reason or purpose? And then also, how independent do you feel in your environment? How much power do you feel like you have in your environment? So these are all the things that I'm looking for when I'm looking at an individual trying to see, do you have a supportive psychosocial environment? Now, these are the things that I'm looking for when I'm looking for a supportive physical environment. What is the actual architecture of the environment look like? Do you have access to transportation? Is that reliable transportation? In terms of climate, one of the things in terms of like, are you in an area that has like lots of storms? Are you in an area where things are changing in terms of a lot of us are talking about in terms of seeing how the extension of summer. I know last year I was still wearing um, short sleeve shirts outside like um, mid October. Um, looking at the physical environment in terms of appropriate technology, do you have like technology? Do you actually have like the ability in terms of one of the things that we saw when a lot of our kids went um, home during COVID is that not having appropriate technology within your home affects your ability to be able to participate in education geography in terms of we're in a part of the country in terms of where we're protected but there's lots of in terms of thinking about like um we're having lots of people dealing with like flooding right now the west we've been talking about how like it's on fire so how does that affect you in terms of like time and time management and then in terms of overall like nationally what's going on with the country so these are all the things that we look at when we're, that's my daughter again. And those are all the things that we're looking at when we're working with individuals and we're trying to see whether or not somebody has a supportive environment. So I want us to go over an example to talk about like looking at something at the social model versus the medical model and really thinking about like the supportive environment of architecture. <clears throat> so let's say that um, I'm going out to lunch with my friend um, who's um, in a wheelchair and um, we're super excited because we're going on a double date. And it's in this new restaurant that's located downtown in the old um, historic area. And so when we get to the restaurant, we're like immediately upset because it doesn't look like we'll be able to get into the building. It's an older um, historic area. There's no ramps. 
and the steps that are in the front are way too steep for us to be able to get her up into the restaurant. So if we were using the medical model, we would say that her inability to walk up the steps prevented her from being able to come into the building and have the double date. If we looked at it through the view of the social model, we would say the fact that the building doesn't have a ramp is what prevented her from going into the building and having a date. That lack of a ramp also limits families with strollers or think about somebody who has like that crying infant that is wiggling and all that kind of stuff and how nice it would be to have a ramp to be able to bring that child up versus really steep steps. Or what about a delivery person who has a really heavy package? So a social model, one of the things that it does is it really takes into consideration not just that one individual, which the medical model, it looks at how does this actually affect the community and the environment? Because while that was a difficulty for my friend, that would be a difficulty with anybody who could not easily get a steep step. So neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, when you look inside of the DSM, there's a whole section that's called neurodevelopmental disorders. And those include ADHD, develop, um, disorders of developmental coordination, tick disorders, developmental intellectual disabilities, autism, specific learning disability, um, child onset fluency, better known as stuttering or speech sound disorders. And these are all called neurodevelopmental disorders because these disorders start during the developmental period. And when I'm saying the developmental period, I'm talking about a, the time prior to a child starting grade school. And these disorders can lead to a range of difficulties for children that can include problems such as difficulties with problem solving and social problems. And the problems can be very specific difficulties to having difficulties in lots of different areas. And um, overall, these difficulties lead to other difficulties. So one of the things about the neurodevelopmental disorders is that they often co-occur with other disorders. And so the things that we'll often see is that we'll either see um, extra behavior, so behaviors more than we typically see in um, the population, or we will see less behaviors than we will see with a typical population. And this difference often leads to these individuals having difficulties being able to coordinate and to um, interact well in the community. And so one of the things in terms of um, especially like me as an assessor, somebody who diagnoses people, it's really important for me to like be aware of like an individual's like um, what's going on with them. But one of the things that I could get really trapped in as an assessor is in the medical model. Because the way that I was trained was to really see like what are the problematic things? What are the ways that the person is dif different than a lot of members in the community? And how are these differences creating difficulties in their lives? And if I just see like these difficulties that the person is having, I can miss so much stuff. Like for one of my kids who are autistic, um, if I just focus on the fact of they have difficulties when they want to make friends, I could miss the fact that they are 
on average have average to very high in um, intelligence. Autistic kids often have large vocabularies. They think visually. They are great at being able to identify patterns. They are really good at being able to see like another perspective and give you some out of the box thinking. Their ability to know information is kind of astounding. I mean, to like encyclopedic like levels of knowledge, very detail oriented, can tell you lots of information about their specialized interests, really good at tasks that are repetitive and very good at tasks um, where a high level of accuracy is needed or where like, like in terms of like, if I'm doing something and I need to like find like one thing, like out of like a thousand things, my autistic kid would be often awesome at finding like that level of detail. Very punctual, something that I do not know about with my neurodiversity and typically very like honest and loyal and just to a fault. So if I just had this medical model, I could miss like all of these positive characteristics that also exist in my neurodivergent individuals. So all of us here, this whole community, we're all neurodiverse, we're all different, but only some of us would be identified as neurodivergent in terms of my brain works in a very specific way and it affects the way that I interact with my community. And there are a number of those people that all those people under that neurodevelopmental um, umbrella, that's all of us. All of us in terms of the ways that our neurology in terms of our brains are shaped and function, it's different and it affects the way that we interact with the community. So I hope that this um, increases everybody's um, education on um, neurodiversity. And next week, um, I will be taking this further and we will talk about a little bit more specifically what is autism. Um, I also wanted to shout out some trainings. Um, I have some trainings um, coming up with the Center for Innovative Practices. Um, next week, I'm doing a training on the culture of poverty um, next Tuesday. And then also during this month, I'll also do another training on equity and behavioral health for all youth and families and looks at um, issues of like um, um, discrimination in terms of in behavioral health. Thank y'all. Thank you.